Zed Mitzel. I am a doctoral student in the program for education um, changing populations. And my topic this afternoon is on concussions. And I want to look at how Maryland athletes are supported for their successful return following a sport related concussion. You've met the members of my committee. And as noted, Dr. Doherty is my chair, Dr. Snyder is my methods person, and Dr. Collier is an external reader. So I think in order to um, kind of ground everybody, it's important to look at definitions and some terms. So when we think about a concussion, um, you may have experienced a concussion, you may have had a family member or a child. And I think um, this video I'm going to show you is about a 40 second clip just defining and it gives a little bit of an animation and it comes from the Center for Disease Control. Um, I might, let me just see if I have to share sound so that you can hear it. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. A concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury, or TBI, caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head. I just put the volume up, sorry. Or by a hit to the body that causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement can literally cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, stretching and damaging the brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. What you might not know is that these chemical changes make the brain more sensitive to any increased stress or injury until it fully recovers. So what's captured there on the side is the information that it can be a bump or blow, blow or jolt. Um, also could be um, a hit to the body. Um, one of my students had a volleyball hit her in a game, um, and I might not have thought that a volleyball would do that kind of damage. Also, we think of um, in football or lacrosse being checked or a tackle and falling, and then, of course, your head hitting the ground. And so understanding that when that twisting and movement takes place in the brain, there are chemical changes also with twisting and a stretching. And so just like any other injury, while your skull may may not show external damage internally, you've had damage. And then that results in the symptoms that I have listed there, which can be characterized as physical, cognitive, and emotional. So physical would be things such as light sensitivity, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, which I'm sure you're familiar with and have, have maybe encountered that. Cognitive could be attention issues, concentration, short-term or long-term memory difficulties. And then emotionally, because again, your brain is responsible for controlling these areas, there could be um, anxiety, nervousness, irritability. And I, I would submit to you that any or all of those areas will impact student learning. And the diagram there is from the Medline Medical Encyclopedia and really captures the same idea that that hit and then that I kind of think of the the um, the red there that it shows. Let's see if this will work. Um, yep. If you look here in the in the red, are you seeing the laser pointer? I hope. So that reddening there, showing that that was where the damage was because the brain maybe had um, interacted with the skull from that injury. So. The background, what I want to do is kind of just give you a, a little bit of an overview of the statistics when I began this research journey in 2010-11. I'm sad to say that's been a while. Um, this was a longitudinal study that came out. 3.4 million high school students had reported one concussion. And now um, the next 10 years study will be coming out. But in the 2018 statistic, 1.1 to 1.9 million concussions in children. CDC and uh, Sarmiento et al. talk about that this is a significant health risk. And the question is, not only is it the students returning to their play and their physical activity, but really what are we doing in the classroom? So initially, um, you see that photo there, that is Zachary Leistet, and he is the middle school student from Washington State, who in 2006 returned too soon following a concussion and then had irreparable damage. Thankfully, he um, it was not fatal, but there is always a risk with a concussion of secondary impacts uh, syndrome. And so in 2009, Washington State 
created the legislation to um, govern returning to play and really instituting that there would be some type of stepwise gradual process for a student to return to the athletic field. Um, it's also um, coined the shake it off law, which um, many of you may have seen that, you know, when a student gets injured or your child and then the coach or even a parent might say, oh, you're fine, shake it off, get back into to the sport. So um, that legislation um, was developed and Maryland usually, as you know, is an early adopter. And in 2010, they developed legislation governing the return to play. So at that point, I was going to examine what that looked like, but because my journey went a little long, kind of my own longitudinal study, um, I then was um, acquainted, became more acquainted in, in my research with the uh, concept of returning to learn. So not only are we supporting the students in a gradual return to the athletic field court um, uh, area, but also what are we doing to support them with academic accommodations, adjust, adjustments, and modifications? So um, currently all, um, all 50 states now have that return to learn, excuse me, return to play legislation. However, the return to learn is where I decided to focus my research efforts. So only eight states have some type of guidance for returning to learn. And in Maryland, the way the regulation is written, which came out in 2010, it releases, there's a section 7-433 and the Code of Maryland regulation where it talks about policies and programs related to concussion. And then from that, they develop the local, or excuse me, the State Board of Education, Maryland State Department of Ed, developed a handbook and guidelines in 2012. And there really is just one line where it talks about in addition, schools shall extend appropriate procedures for academic accommodations to student athletes who have been diagnosed with a concussion. And what is typical in Maryland is that it is state mandated and local control. So my questions then became, well, exactly what does that look like in a school? And what does it look like in Montgomery County, a very large wealthy district compared to Baltimore City, a large district, but with a lot of challenges compared to Garrett in the mountains or Worcester or Wicomico on the shore. So as I did my research for my literature review, this conceptual framework started to surface. And so I originally had it drawn with arrows, but I, I really like this model with the zones of influence. So um, kind of looking at the top left, when you see Maryland law, and so Maryland law impacts MPSSAA, which is the Maryland Public School Athletic Association, which is an arm of the Maryland State Board that governs athletics in Maryland. Then, of course, there's the state board, and the state board pushes out regulation to the local boards, you know, in Maryland, 24 local school districts, also known as the counties and Baltimore City. And they impact the school leaders and what you would suspect is that the school leader principal or system principal really is that point person. Then if we focus or look down on the bottom right of the diagram, see so if I can get my laser pointer. If you look down here, we have our medical community, American Academy of Neurology, American Academy of Pediatrics, Center for Disease Control, and their communication with the medical professionals. And of course, they're interacting with teachers and parents in terms of a parent bringing a student who has had a concussion to the medical provider, and what are we gonna do for my child? Um, but what, what the question is, is exactly how specific are we, and how does that communication manifest, it's, manifest itself with teachers, also with the coach, and then in the center is the student athlete their safety, health, and well-being. And I'll refer back to this conceptual framework because as I've developed my study, I want to look at the guidelines and exactly how that translates what is happening in schools and who is supporting from the medical community with the guidelines that are suggested as a appropriate way to manage returning to learn.
And this arrow really zooms in if you had to focus on one particular area that I'm examining in this study, it really is con the convergence there where the arrow shows it's that communication and training and resource support that the medical professional might suggest or that we know that the students need compared to the teacher and the parent, the interaction with the coach and what is actually being done. How consistent is that? And how are we supporting students as they return to learn following that concussive episode that I showed in the first slide or two? So as I continued with my research, I certainly have been able to find gaps. And thankfully, um, the fact that it took me 10 years to put this all together, there um, had not been a solution, and it really only is compounded and magnified, and I, that's what I wanted to highlight with you this afternoon. So as I said, we do have return to play. 50 states have um, completed that legislation, although there are not there is not specific guidance to navigate returning to learn, and there is no specific return to learn protocol in Maryland. And the last update is what I shared earlier in 2012. There are guidelines that we should provide quote appropriate accommodations quote. And so, what does that really look like? There's also been limited attention to the returning to learn for students, and that's documented with Halstead and through CDC, and then also most recently, Patricio's et al. in 2022, which um, was a report from the consensus statement on sport-related concussion, which is a governing body that's international that meets every few years. And so recently, um, that was another update that we still are not doing enough. Then I also um, came across and researched various studies. So when we look at, there was a study in 2015 of Ohio principles, a cross-sectional study, and what they found with a 66% return rate was that few data exist for return to learn practices. So again, what does that look like? How does that really play out in a school? Similarly, in the Indiana principal study, they noted that there was limited training, although in the 157 principals that responded of 410, they do have a willingness to provide. So kind of you characterize that, that we know we should be doing something, but really what exactly are we doing and how is that mapped out? Um, they also looked at ac academic accommodations, training and barriers. And you'll see some of the pieces from these studies are what I've put forth when I get to my research design and my survey. Also, there was a Nebraska study looking across all educational professionals. They wanted to examine how are the policies and protocols in place helping. They found that 80% of principals have a return to learn, yet only 52% of teachers were aware or knew or implemented return to learn. So that for me highlighted a disconnect that maybe at the state level, there are guidelines, but the teachers are kind of those first responders on the ground and they're not um, where they need to be in, in implementation. And then the survey of athletic trainers also found that 41% noted an absence of any type of return to learn guideline. So I talked a little bit about in the conceptual framework, the um, key pieces from the medical community. And so these two governing bodies have come to light, the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics, and then the consensus statement in con on concussion in sport, which is international committee. And what they all put forth, you see there the importance of a team or someone to coordinate this return to learn. Um, they talk about accommodations, the idea of rest and reduce screen time, and then various other adjustments, um, which there, there are listed, but some of the examples would be an academic adjustment, like a break, a quiet area, putting your head down, an academic accommodation might be extended time, a scribe, having notes, or modification, maybe a delayed start or early dismissal. So from the studies and the body of knowledge that I did review, I formulated my research questions, which you see here. 
So my number one question is really how are school leaders supporting the athletes for their return? And then sub questions under number one would be at the school level, what does that look like? Do we have a guideline, a protocol, or a process? If you do, are they followed? If you don't, then that, of course, is a concern. And then the literature points to academic adjustments, accommodations, and modifications, as I described in the previous slide, directly aligned to the, what the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests. So I'm going to look at that alignment. Also from the studies, looking at possible or potential barriers and challenges, and then what kind of training. And I really see that number two and number three could also inform Maryland policy, which is a direct connection to my work at Maryland State Department of Education and understanding that legislative and policy process. So for my methodology, I am going to, would like, if I'm approved, would like to conduct a quantitative research design exploratory cross-sectional survey of school administrators, namely principals and assistant principals. My sample selection will be a convenient sample of Maryland school administrators listed there based on the Qualtrics survey and research calculator. There are approximately 400 secondary schools. The sample size would be 132, which would yield a 95% confidence, 7% margin of error. Um, what I would like to do is push out my survey through connections with the Maryland Secondary Association of School Principals, also through social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, various groups. Um, so. Uh, in terms of reaching across the state to get a good cross-sectional survey. My survey instrument is based on the four studies that I just re recently described. And to do that, I took the questions and then conducted a expert review panel so that I could have them review key components in each survey item. Um, and I will show you a matrix on where each, how they fit with each um, study. And I have more details on the panel, depending on how time permits. Now my, my analysis will be largely descriptive statistics, although there could be potential for inferential, inferential um, with chi-squared maybe looking at various groups to determine if there's any um, impact. I'm going to skip the panel in the interest of time and show you my survey matrix. What um, you see in the first column is the content as described, looking at the demographic information, um, the involvement, return to learn guidelines. In the second column, you see sample questions. A sample question for demographic would be, what is your role? How long have you been in it? And then the source on the third column shows you the studies that I uh, used to base my questioning on for the survey. And then in purple or bluish there, you see the one. The one means that those questions and categories relate to my first research question. Barriers and challenges, the two relates to my second. And then training provided relates to my third. And in the accommodations and modifications, uh, that is from the International Consensus Statement and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I'm going to look at that alignment based on the way I'm crafting my survey. Ethical considerations, I have received approval from the IRB at Notre Dame of Maryland. I would ask that the participants, by completing the survey, that would be an expressed form of consent. I am not collecting any identifying information. There is no obligation to participate in the survey or complete it. Participants may exit at any time, um, and I'll leave that for you to look at um, on that slide.
And by my estimation, it looks like we have about a minute early and we have 10 minutes for questions. And that's what I was told to uh, prepare. So I want to keep everybody on track and I will uh, open it up for questions and maybe I'll have some answers. Okay. All right. And go ahead and just stop sharing your screen so we can all see. Oh, yes. Perfectly. Okay. okay. So we got all the faces. Okay. Okay. 